the transplant really um it wasn't actually as bad a journey as I was expecting because I'd done a lot of research around obviously looking on the internet and there's so many bad stories out there so I was quite freaked out about how I was going to feel to be honest um, and, then, and then I remember going in to see Professor Cook and he was telling me everything that could go wrong and then you have the mobility scar or whatever it's called and everything just seemed to be quite doom and gloom and in reality my transplant went really smoothly. Having the transplant for me personally was um, not a pleasurable experience but um, I didn't find it arduous or it didn't take a great deal out of me. I mean I don't know what the record is at the moment but I, I came out of this hospital after 16 days I mean, I was lucky, I didn't get an infection uh, or anything that would have held me back. I mean, sometimes, yes, you can. I've had chemotherapies where I've been in seven or eight weeks. Um, so I know it can, I was lucky. But uh, for me personally, the transplant experience was a very, very good one. I'd like to think that, yes, I was prepared in terms of, it was quite emo an emotional, once this, when, when we were getting the stem cells, I didn't realise then how emotional I would be at that time because it was like, they more or less kill off, well, they do kill off all your bone marrow and everything, so there's nothing there. And the fact that then you get in the transplant and even though you don't feel any difference, you know that your blood group's changing, everything else is changing, you becoming a different person biologically, but not you know, in yourself. Uh, and that was quite a, yeah, it took me a quite a, f a few weeks actually to come to terms with that. The transplant, what I expected from the transplant was, and was it what I expected? No, no, it never is. It, I thought it was going to be a lot harder and a lot more worse. It's the unknown. I didn't know the unknown, to be honest. But the overall experience of the transplant was a bit of an anticlimax, if I'm honest. You know, you think, oh, I'm, I'm getting this transplanted and I've got these cells and what will it do to me? Will it alter or will it hurt? But no, it's just a simple transfusion. And it was over and done with within a couple of hours. They drip it in nice and slow and it was, it was fine. It was fine. It's just... Afterwards, then the hard work starts. So, but yeah, overall the transplant was good. It was, it was okay. Yeah. The transplant itself was um, very quick, and it it was it was. I, I remember my nurse who gave me my trans who who actually administered the stem cells into me. And in a way, it feels quite special because that was the beginning of me getting better. And that's how I always looked at having my transplant. It was just my road to getting better. And on that day when Professor Cook was telling me all the rubbish about that, what could happen, when I left his office, he said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel excited. And he said, nobody has ever left my office feeling excited. I said, well, this is my chance of getting a cure. And my biggest dream throughout was to just get the cure and to one day be a grandma. That is my biggest dream. And it, this was the only route to be a, being able to have that dream. And so on the day of the transplant itself, I just felt like, right, this is it. Now it's just going to get better and better and better. The two emotions that you feel most in my, in my experience are euphoria uh, and absolute doubt and they couldn't be further apart in terms of the, the feelings that you experience all the time because every little thing that happens in terms of the way that you're feeling you take as a sign, uh, whether it be positive or negative. So on the day that I got the, um, the cells infused, it's just euphoric because I felt good. I felt surprisingly strong um, and knowing that that new life is going into it is really really exciting because it's something that you've waited a long time to get to and then following that when you do get ill you start questioning 
is that have I got an immune system? Is it going to work? Am I ever going to be well again? And though it really is one to the next. In my in my transplant, it was it was very high, very low. When when you go in, everybody has um, an individual room, which is a nice idea um, when you think about it. That you go, you know, you. Uh, my initial thought was, oh, I'll be able to sleep. There won't be other people there, but it is quite isolating that you're not allowed to leave the room. I think at first, for the first week, there's so much happening that the nurses are in all the time um, because you're having lots of treatments when they're doing the conditioning for the, for the transplant. So you see quite a lot of people and it's still new. Um, so there's a, there's a lot happening, but after that initial week and once you've had the stem cells for the transplant um, it's just a recovery time um, there isn't as much happening in terms of medication and things going on so you don't see as much of people um, as you do for the first week and it's it is quite isolating even though I did have visitors for most of that time they're all carrying on with their lives outside and you're stuck in there and it is quite a lonely existence nobody actually they all you know they know you're ill but they they've no understanding of how you feel and that's quite difficult I used to spend my time um, doing puzzles and things and I think that was more not not to give me something it was more to block out the fact that I was on my own nobody fully understands what it's like um, to be on your own and ill they can't somebody once told me um, that being ill is one of the loneliest things that can happen to you and, and they were right I didn't I didn't understand it when they told me that because I wasn't ill at the time you know and I thought well I don't know what you mean because you get out and you do things but it is there's nothing you can do to prepare for being isolated um, I don't think there is anyway I think you just have to deal with that as it comes along. My family were amazing through the whole thing and friends. And the thing that really, really picked me up on the hardest days was a message from a mate, a phone call, a card from whoever. Um, those sorts of things remind you of what you are actually fighting for. And on some days, it does feel really, really tempting to give up, to not bother anymore because it's too hard. But with the right people around you and those reminders, physical reminders are really, really important as well. Cards, pictures, having things on display that tell you what you're aiming for. That's massively important because it's not always easy to, in mentally to put those dark thoughts in a box and put them to one side but just by looking at something physical you can very quickly overcome it because it's a it puts a pleasant thought into your mind instead of the negativity of, of just feeling rubbish which you do a lot of the time uh, and you wonder if it'll ever end that's probably the, the the they're the factors that help you get through it other people's inputs the, the thing is yes it is a it is a very difficult time it, it, it can be hard and how do you keep pushing through once you go through two transplants or a transplant the thing is the positivity you've got to try and keep positive ultimately it's family friends and your own self-preservation yes there are, the, there are days that are very dark there are days where you just feel like pulling the sheets up and but yeah it's okay to do that it's okay to do that everybody has bad days but ultimately you you're here and you're there for one reason and that's to live your life to to survive you you can either i don't know if it's fight or flight and you just dig in and try and keep stronger but most of all what I found was to keep a sense of humour. Keep a have, a, have a good sense of humour and try and brighten the days up with a bit of laughter or a, a joke and a laugh and mess about sometimes. I know I did.
I visualised a lot. I visualised having a healthy body. I visualised um, my cancer disappearing. And I actually visualised how I wanted my future to look. So I visualised being a grandma because, as I've told you, that was my biggest wish. I visualised every aspect, really, of my life, how I wanted it to look. And I got the visualising idea from a book that I read. And it was about really the power of the mind and connecting the mind and the body. And I knew I couldn't fix myself by the power of my mind. But I did think that if I got my mind and my body working together and being that calm and peaceful and focused on my future type person, that I had a far better chance of getting well. I think motivating yourself to... Uh, the, the ultimate motivation is that you, you don't have a choice. Uh, you, you, if you give up, you will not get to that transplant. So the ultimate motivation for all of it is that if I get through this, we get to the next stage, which is more chemo. If I get through this, we get to the next stage, which is preparation for transplant. We get through that, we get to transplant, and we get through transplant, we've got a chance of beating the cancer. And that's the thing that you have to maintain perspective on all the time, that constant reminder to yourself that you are fighting something that will not give up. And if you give up, it will win. And that's the bottom line, so you, you just keep going. If you're in a situation, especially if you're in a situation like me where I was probably 10, probably 15, 20 years younger than most of the, pe most of the people who were diagnosed with my condition, uh, most of them are 60s, 70s, and I got it quite early in my late 40s. But try and look at it from a point of view like I did, that's an advantage. Don't look at it from a point of view, God, I've got this. Look at it from, yeah, but I'm young enough to have a good chance of surviving it. My percentages are better. Try and, I know it's hard, because I found it hard. Try and be positive as you can. If you come in here, if you decide to have that transplant, you come in here, there's one thing I'd say to you. Uh, one bit of advice I'd give anybody who come in here is, because <clears throat> the staff don't mind, is, Every available free space in your room, stick a photograph up, stick a picture up, stick some, a, photo, a picture or something, photograph that means something to you. I had Buzz Lightyear toys and stuff like that because my partner said to me, you know, infinity and beyond, you know, that's where how long we'll be together and pictures of my grandchildren, pictures of my girlfriend and my family. Just so when you have them bad days, uh, you know, and you don't feel like raising your head off your pillow, it might be that photograph that gives you a good day. Don't be thinking, oh, staff won't like it. The staff will help you stick them up if you want. Uh, but whatever it is that you feel like you need to do to make it a positive experience for you, then do it. The overall support network, I had a, I had a very good support network with family. That's, a, that's an important one. Friends, the, the medical staff, the nurses, everybody that was involved in my time of the transplant being in hospital, absolutely fantastic. And it's, you've got to try and pull a positive out of anything, especially with a life-threatening thing and setting yourself up to, to move forward and to move on. You've got to prepare yourself to be able to push that because there's going to be days where you do, if I'm honest, you, you could just lay there. It, it, it'd be so easy to think, oh, this is too hard. And it is. You know, I'm not going to lie, it is. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And my life now is absolutely fantastic. When I was first diagnosed, I was 41. And uh, my children were 13 and 15. And I was devastated because I knew that unless I had the transplant, I only had a few years to live. And the thought of not being around to see my children grow up and my children having that hole where I should be, really, um, it made me so desperately sad. And then all of a sudden, I just thought, you know, this is not how I want to be. If I only have a few years to live, then I don't want to spend them crying and being sad. I wanted to sort of fill it with as much fun, love and laughter, really, as I could. 
And so I started looking at things that I could do to make me feel more happier. I started, um, this will sound, might sound weird, but I started a, gra um, a gratitude journal and I started writing things down that I was really happy for because when I focused on all the things that were actually good around me, my illness seemed a bit quite a small thing. I'd been in hospital for four weeks and um, I'd had the intensive chemotherapy, I'd lost my hair and I'd come out and I was having a month to recover before I went in to do it all again and I was doing some baking at home and I was singing and I actually stopped myself because I was like well why am I singing am I really happy and I stood there and I was like am I happy and actually I decided that yes I was happy and so I kept put my music back on and I just carried on. The hard part with the infections were uh, uh, ru running in such a high temperature I was almost d delirious um, and uh, when they did get it under control they, they added drugs to get the infection under control actually made the sickness even worse. There were points when I uh, my worst and my worst times were when I had infections where I just wanted it all to end. To end. It was uh, very selfish, really, because uh, you didn't really think about family or things because you were just so poorly. Thankfully, that only lasted maybe four or five days, and, and then, then once the infection started to become under control, you started feeling positive again and started feeling like, you know, you just want to get it all over with. Every day you're just hoping you're going to feel a little bit better and every day you're hoping you're going to get closer to going home. And you start feeling about your fa thinking about your family and they're, they're hoping you're going to get, get to go home. But there were a few days where I felt very selfish because I, I felt uh, I just wanted it all to end really because I just felt so, so ill. You can't watch television. I, I've, I found personally I couldn't read. I couldn't do quizzes, I couldn't do jigsaws. I just didn't have the, the will to do that, whereas to sit and watch television was a lot easier for me. I was surprised, actually, as to how the will to do things like read a book or read a magazine or jigsaws just weren't there in, in, in me. You'd think if you're in a, in a confined area and you've got six or seven weeks ahead of you that you'd willingly do that. And you, you, beforehand you plan to do things like that, but then you just, I just didn't do it. Yeah, reminding yourself that the feelings you have are temporary and it may, it may take a day, it might even take a week or two, but you will feel better. I, I wasn't really sure what to expect and um, I had to take every single day as it, as, it, as it came and it was an awful long process, so for that reason it was very hard because you you kept wanting things to go faster. You wanted to fast forward your life at that period. And I, can th I think back now and I, I remember lying in hospital thinking, I wish I could push a magic button and take me forward three or four months. So, so that was hard. And I think going back to what I've just said, you need to take every single day as it comes and be patient. Embrace what you've got. Embrace the full ride, so to speak, the full experience. I know it's not a pleasant one. It can be uncomfortable. But like life, it, you've got to embrace what it is. It is what it is. And if you move with it, or don't move against it, and just let the people in charge do what they do. And you'll just stay strong be all right. I'm a person who just who's never been ill before ever and I think that's and I, I never wanted to be ill. I'm not I don't like it. <laughs> it's not me. I'm, it takes the control away from me. My husband thinks I'm a control freak and I probably am and being ill takes the control away from you. The illness has got the control and then the doctors are in charge of, of that. Even though they will answer any questions, tell you exactly what they're doing, why they're doing it, it still takes the control away from you. And that's one of the things I found really difficult because 
I, I know I like being in, in control and, and I'm not anymore. When, when you are at the point where your neutrophils are starting to come up and you are in, uh, in that room and irrespective of, of the things that you've got around you and the people that are visiting, it's you. For, for me, I had, to take, I had to believe that I had an element of control over it, whether I was conning myself or not. Uh, I don't know, but I, I, I do think that there is a certain amount uh, that, that, that your brain can achieve by being positive and overcoming it, because I think if you're just defeatist about it and, and felt that it was beating you, then I, I, I don't think that you'd have as good a chance of getting over it. So just believing that just by getting up uh, and going for a walk over to the window and having a stretch uh, and maybe just, even if you just do one sit up in bed <laughs> or something, just something that feels like you're kicking your body into action, that you're demanding that your bone marrow makes those red blood cells, makes those white blood cells because you, you, you need them. For me, it felt like a bit of control. Whether that's an actual medical reality, I doubt it, but anything that you can do when you're in there that, that makes you feel that it's you that's the boss, that makes a difference. Most mornings, I would say 98% of the time I got up, I had a routine. Um, so I would have my breakfast, have a shower, put my makeup on, sit in the chair in the, in the corner of the room and crochet until lunchtime. And then in the afternoon I would sleep, meditate, my husband would come and see me, I'd have my evening meal, then I'd get into my pyjamas and then I'd watch telly for the evening. I didn't even watch TV during the day um, because I just didn't want to sit there just watching TV. And I think the routine really helped me stay quite sane and focused and happy and positive because I knew what I was going to do each day. Sometimes I, you know, I used to put my track suits on with all my makeup on and sit there crocheting in, in the corner and nobody would see me all day and I was like, why am I doing this? But it made me feel better. Now I'm six years down the line from diagnosis, five from transplant. I've basically forgot that and only remember the good times. It seems hard that six months of my life, which is what it were, during transplant and getting all the viruses and being confined seems such a long time, as in, real, in reality it's only a short time. I, I find it difficult now to express how hard it were during that six month period, knowing, not knowing when you're going to get back into the outside world. Uh, whereas now I've been in it for quite a while, it's hard to remember that confinement bit. Being away from family and friends and basically being in isolation I didn't find that um, a particularly negative thing. I understood exactly the reasons for it. I was quite happy to have no visitors because it was explained to me the importance of staying free from infection. So although I was basically in isolation, I didn't feel isolated. Um, uh, I mean, I had a phone which I could contact people on. So it wasn't a problem at all. Well, the biggest thing that got me through the experience, without a doubt, were family visits. If I didn't have the family visits, I, I, I don't think I could have made it. Right? Um, the hospital stay itself can be very lonely because you're in a confinement as, as, as your um, immune system is really low. And having the double doors and, and things like that there, uh, you, you don't know what's going on, you don't see other patients because you're, you're confined for your own good uh, and that can be a lonely time. I used to just switch off, it was a way of coping I think with being, being in there and sort of, I can't really explain that. I think when I was doing the puzzles and doing these things it was just blocking out the fact that I was in this room on my own. So it's really hard, and I think that depends on what sort of person you are, how you deal with it, and that's just the way I did it. I tried to sleep my way through it a lot when visitors weren't there. Um, not all visitors uh, are, are good for you. <laughs> Some come and, 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 and sit there and look at you like a goldfish. I did feel a bit like a goldfish at times, because they were there you know, and didn't know what to say. That Some people came and saw me once and never came back again. Uh, 
I've now found out that they couldn't cope with seeing me looking not like I do now. Because uh, now I look like I did before. I think what I wish I'd known before transplant was more hope that it could be done without being extremely ill. I had quite a smooth journey through my transplant. I wasn't really, I didn't suffer with sickness. I, I really feel like I quite sailed through it. I did have rigours um, on two or three occasions and they're horrible and that's when your temperature goes like really high. I think my temperature was about 40.2 and your body just shakes like crazy. And I actually had a panic attack at the same time so I was not breathing right either. I was just like a complete mess on the bed. And that was just like, that was one night and that was the illest I felt the whole time. I wish I could have seen some really good stories before I went in to know that yes, this can be done and it can be done in a very positive way. Because I think I expected to be bed bound and feeling really sick the whole time. It made me uh, put things into perspective. Uh, I mean, I had therapy for anxiety um, and depression, which was associated with uh, the diagnosis and the transplant process. Therapy focused on being po more positive about the future and not feeling that I had to be strong, accepting that I was ill and dealing with whatever came my way. Not being frightened to ask for support and not being frightened to ask for things that will help and not to be um, a soldier in a way, you know, to to just say, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling here. Can you help with this or can you help with that? Um, unfortunately, with, with the people that I asked, whether it be family, friends, medical team, therapists, um, I got through it because of them. One thing that um, you must understand is when you want information from your consultant, they will give you all the information you need. But it's, I found it was very hard for them to be positive to you. There was one thing that I, I, I did find, I suppose, quite difficult, but I got to understand it in time, and um, you mustn't let that affect you. Going home after the transplant is, a, I found it a little strange. Um, I, I think to some extent, for me personally, I felt a little guilty that things had gone well for me. I found it quite strange. During the process of having my transplant, you get to know other people in the same situation. You know, even if you're, you're neutropenic and you can't leave your room, you stand in that doorway some days and you speak to each other. You know, you can be in here for a long time. You, you, you do develop relationships. And to find out that people were struggling and you weren't, or had struggled and you weren't, and, and to lose people along the way, not necessarily due to the transplant, who were, Ill, were just too ill um, to actually have the transplant. And, as, and even though the staff endeavoured to get them well enough, they couldn't get them well enough, and you know whatever illness they had took them before they could have a transplant. That was hard, you know, because I sat at home and thought, you know, we lost so and so, and so and so was pretty badly, and you know, and I felt guilty that it had gone well for me. How I feel about having a transplant now, um, a lot of people find it strange to hear me say this, but I, I do honestly believe to be that I'm a lucky man because I was born in this age when there's that sort of t uh, technology around and advancements around to allow me to have one. I was lucky enough to get a match, I was lucky enough to be well enough to have it. Um, yeah, uh, I'd rather not. I'd rather have been unlucky in that circumstances and not got it in the first place. But there you go. I was unlucky enough to be chosen. It chose me. Uh, I was given an option, uh, and it worked for me. So uh, I, about, uh, how I feel about a transplant is, I feel um, that I've been given my life back, or given a life. You know, given the chance to to live my life. Uh, which, you know, at some points I thought, you know, we're going to be taken away from me, irrespective of the fact that, you know, I didn't really get very seriously ill. Um, at some points when I were pretty ill and I thought, you know, it's touch and go here, yeah? you know. So to be given this opportunity now, you know, I grasped it with both hands and, you know, I aren't letting go of it. Somebody's going to have to take it off me.
you know, that's my chance now. You know, so yeah, hats off to everyone concerned, you know, that got me through it. It's uh, a wondrous thing. So here we go.